Our passage this week from the book of Genesis, Genesis 37, Joseph. This chapter basically introduces us to Joseph. He was mentioned in the birth, uh, but here we really get into who he is in his story. And then most of the rest of Genesis focuses on him. There's the chapter 38, that kind of talk, uh, parenthetical kind of chapter there about Judah. But uh, the most of it, for the most part, is about Joseph. And this is, again, our real introduction to, to him. Starting in verse 2, Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. So that is kind of interesting. So he's out there working in the fields with his half-brothers that are from the two concubines. So Benjamin's probably too young to be out in the field, I'd imagine. And so he's 17 years old, so he's working with them, the, these four other brothers, two from uh, Bilhah, two from Zilpah, and, uh, and they're out there together. Now why he's with them, I'm not sure, I don't know. Maybe Jacob, uh, Israel, decided to divide up the flock, and so he sent uh, the six brothers, all from Leah, to work uh, the one group, maybe the goats, and he sent these other ones to, to work with the sheep, or whatever reason, he's working today, this day, with, with those four. And none of the sons of Leah are, are there. They're all, whatever they're doing, uh, separately. And again, Benjamin, I imagine, is, is home. Uh, and so he's there with them, and they did something. We don't know what, <laughs> but something, they didn't do something, and Joseph didn't think it was right, and Joseph went and told his father. Now, I'd imagine if it was really, really serious, the Bible would tell us. I mean, the Bible tells us, like, what more than we should need to know, right? But, but it doesn't say anything here of what they did, what they were doing, and so I, it probably wasn't too serious, or whatever the case, but he goes and tells his father. Now, the fact that we know about it today means that's not where it ended, right? So his father made it known some way, shape, or form to the four other uh, sons that uh, Joseph had told on them, and then uh, they had done something wrong, and they got reprimanded. Now, from what we've seen of, of, of Jacob thus far, I'd imagine that's about all he did, was reprimand him. <laughs> that he didn't do any kind of discipline that was enough to, uh, to, to, to stop whatever they were doing and to justify Joseph and what he did and that they learned a lesson and they were wrong and Joseph was right for tattling on them. Uh, it was that serious offense. Uh, I imagine he just, you know, said, don't do that ever again. <laughs> and Joseph told me about you and you better watch out because he's got his eyes on you. And, uh, and so it made Joseph look bad in their eyes. And so this is where we see this first mention of this kind of a tension between Joseph and at least some of his other brothers. And so he was a tattletale, right? They, uh, they, they, they have a, uh, a term for that nowadays. I don't know. I don't necessarily know how it started, but uh, Karen. Have anyone heard that? It's horrible if you had named Karen. <laughs> they were able to, Karen, these people who are busy bodies and they, they're getting everyone else's business and they're always pointing out everybody else's faults. And, and, uh, and so he's, you know, that's his character here from the start. He's, he's, he's fault finding and he's going and tattling and telling dad about what his brothers did that was so horrible. Verse 3, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. So Israel, Jacob called Israel throughout this chapter, uh, Israel loves Joseph more than all his children. Not a good thing. Not a good tactic. Not a good principle. And Israel should have learned that from his father, wrong example, of loving Esau more than him. He knew what it was like to have his brother loved more than him, and so he should have known how the other 11 and the sisters would have felt by loving Joseph more than him, but he does it again, he did the same pattern. He does it anyway. Isn't that horrible? Yeah. Horrible? Yes. But I wonder how many of us growing up Said, so when I grow up, I'm never going to do what mom and dad are doing. I'm never going to do to my children what they, I hate that they say, well, do so because I said so. <laughs> Why, I hate that. Why do they do that? Or 
Stop crying. I'll give you, you want to cry? I'll give you a reason to cry, right? Or some other thing that they gave you. I'm never going to say that to my kid, you know, or, or I'm never going to do that, right? You got an alcoholic parent. I'm never going to be an alcoholic, right? Yeah, that's some abusive. And then the pattern, the sin from the third and fourth generation passes down. But it can be broken by the power and blood of Yeshua. That he can change our hearts. He can change our minds. But if we just determine in our own strength, I'm not going to do that because I didn't like how it was done, it's not going to work. Here's a prime example of it not working. We just determine in our own strength, we will fail every time. But by God's grace, God can change us. And we can do all things through him who strengthens us. He changes us, transforms us, makes all things new, gives us his character, not the character that we were stamped with our inherited tendencies to evil. And so it's a horrible thing, and we see him manifesting here, and it just makes uh, more tensions because of that. And, uh, and it says that he made, then he not only does he love him more, but then he demonstrates his love for him more. It's one thing if he just loved him in his heart more, but then he shows it outwardly by giving him this tunic of many colors, which could be a very indication that he is thinking he's going to be the inheritor of the double portion of the, of, the, um, of the birthright and of the messianic line of the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now it says here in the text, because he, Joseph, was the son of his old age. I'm not exactly sure why Moses put that there. I'm sure he had a reason for writing it that way. But he wasn't the youngest. He wasn't, so Benjamin was the child of his even older age. Right? So if it had to do with how old he was, then he would have loved Benjamin the most. So it was more than just that. I think it had everything to do with Joseph was Rachel's firstborn child. And in Jacob's mind, Rachel was his first wife. In reality, it was Leah, and we saw in that sermon how God, while Jacob rejected Leah, God accepted Leah. God exalted Leah. And you can see that on shalomadventure.com. Very powerful. Lots of evidence of that throughout the text and throughout the scriptures and history. But in Jacob's mind, he favored Rachel. He loved Rachel. And so he manifested that in his marriage as well. Loved Rachel more than Leah. And so he wanted Rachel's firstborn to be the firstborn. Now, we can understand why he overlooks Reuben. We read that Reuben had sex with one of his concubines, one of his other wives. Uh, and so he lost, <laughs> he lost out on the birthright. Uh, and uh, Simeon and Levi, well, they kill all the men and vengeance because uh, a prince of the town of Shechem raped their sister. And so in vengeance and overboard, they, they kill all the men of the city. And so they lose out on their birthright. But then Judah's the next one in line. And uh, we'll see Judah come up in this story, and maybe this helps us to see why Judah comes up in this story the way he does. Because technically, he should have been the next one in line. But here, we're seeing in Jacob's mind, he bypasses Judah, he bypasses all the others, and he's exalting Joseph to the birthright status and giving him this fancy coat. And that does not help with the family relationships, as we see. Verse 4, when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. So this uh, favoritism in the family just bred hatred, as it normally does. And so also for us in our families uh, or in our communities, in our congregation, in our in our work setting, if you're in a position, or school setting, or wherever you're at, we show favoritism to others. The Bible says to love our neighbor, as we just sung, love our neighbor as ourselves. Right? So that it's equally all our neighbors, to love all our neighbors as much as we love ourselves. And you know what? You love yourself supremely. <laughs> you may be insecure, you may even be suicidal, but you love yourself more than you love everybody else in the world. And that's how we're made. And so the Bible says to love everybody as much as you love yourself. 
even to love our enemies as much as we love ourselves. And do good to them and pray for them. And so love all. Because that's how God loves us. God's no respecter of persons. God loves us all equally. He paid one price for all of us. He paid one price for you, as he paid for you, as he paid for me. He paid one price for us all. And so we're all equal in value to him. Now he grants different talents, some to five, some to three, some to one, based on other factors, but that's not a showing of love more or favoritism more. He loves all equally. Now we can receive his love more by our choices, but he pours out his love available to all. To those who accept it, to those who don't accept it, his, on his part, he pours out his love equally. And when we take on his spirit more and more, we'll be able to manifest that more and more. And it's hard, like in the congregational setting, right? It's hard, you know, I need to love everyone, treat everyone fairly, and treat everyone equally, and loving everyone, right? And so I do. I, love, I don't love anyone here more than others. There's some I don't like as much as others, but I love more than, than any. Right? You'll get that in a moment. But anyway. Um, verse 5. Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. And then he said, please, hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field. And then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. His brother said, shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. So obviously he said some more words in addition to his telling the dream. And they hated him for the dreams and for his words. They mentioned they hated him three times now. They hate him, they hate him, they hate him. They hate him because his dad is exalting him, and now, in their mind, he's exalting himself with his dreams. And I don't know why exactly he told it to them. I mean, I'm sure so that we have the record of it, and, and God was able to use it later uh, to convict them. But on just a human level, I mean, they didn't want to hear it, right? They hated him. They already hated him. They couldn't even speak peaceably to him. Right? We read that in the last slide. Are right? there people in your life that you can't talk speak peaceably to? Yeah, people that you uh, talk nicely to other people, but then you turn to this person and you know, your face falls and you can't say anything nice. Or they... Someone else talking about them, and you uh, can't say anything nice about them. You see a car that's just like the car that they drive, and even though they're not in that car driving, it's a totally different car, but it looks and reminds you of them. And all of a sudden, your mind goes into all the negative things. Or maybe someone mentions their name, not even about them, just the same name. <laughs> talking about somebody else, but it's the same name. And your mind goes back to the one, your nemesis, and... You start thinking about them and you can't think peaceably, can't talk peaceably about them or to them. That's how much hatred they have. And it's not godly and it's not good. And through confession and the blood of Messiah, we can be cleansed of those attitudes. And so anytime we experience that, anytime we realize that, anytime God's Spirit convicts us, some person, Maybe from our past, maybe from our present, maybe in our future. Right away, we need to confess it and surrender it. And give it over to the Lord so he can change our attitude so that we can love even those who have not been good to us. So Joseph here at this point, other than tattling, he's really not doing anything. Man, it's just pure jealousy. And it's what his father has done in exalting him. Maybe you've had that done to you. Maybe you've had some employer or some parent or someone uh, loving others more than you, giving more to others, and even if you deserved it, worked harder, worked more talented, put in more hours, did whatever. You deserved it, but then they gave it to position or favor or gratitude to someone else. And so they're jealous. And in some ways, in that sense, justified, not that it's ever really justified, but we can see the reasoning. And so they hate him because of his dreams. And they say, now, it says here, uh, 
He told them the dreams, they hated me more, and he said, please hear the dream. So obviously he was begging them, please listen to the dream. They didn't want to hear it. <laughs> you know, and so whether he was just this naive 17-year-old, well, you know, I don't know, and he's just going out telling them, oh, they're going to want to hear this dream too. Or this will finally convince them, God gave me this dream, and so, you know, now they'll actually let me be uh, favored and, uh, and like me because uh, it's not me, it's not dad, it's God who's giving. I don't know why. You know, he just felt like, I got to tell you, please listen to this dream. And so he, he, he tells them, uh, or again, maybe again, it was God compelling them to tell it for later on conviction. But he's not reading their body language at all, right? He's not, he's not reading them, he's not seeing that they, they just hate him. Or maybe he did. And maybe he just was, so maybe he was naive, or maybe he was arrogant. And trying to use this and prove it to them and tell them, you got to listen to me. This is from God. Verse 9. Then he dreamed still another dream. And he told it to his brothers. Look, I have another dream. This time the sun and the moon and the 11 stars bowed down to me. He told it to his father and his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to you, the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. And so we see Jacob here, kind of this waffling back and forth, uh, not really consistent. He, he rebukes him, but at the same time he's cherishing in his mind, yeah, yeah, my, my, uh, my son that I favor, that I love, he's going to be exalted one day. He's not so happy that he's going to have to bow down on him, but, but he's, he's putting it in mind. He puts it in the back of his mind. He keeps it, holds on to it. Kind of like Mary uh, when, uh, when, when she was told about Yeshua, that she kept it in mind. And, and, uh, and when maybe when he went for his bar mitzvah, went to the temple for the first time, and my father's house, and she kept it in mind, storing these things up. And so he stores this up and holds it there. And one day, something's going to happen. But at the same time, he rebukes him, right? So he didn't just say, well, this is obviously from God. We all need to go along with this. And, and you know, you guys need to stop hating him and because this is from God. No, he rebukes him. Why rebuke him if, if you believe that God's speaking to him and, and this is what you're promoting anyway? And so this is the kind of unfair dealings that Jacob did, and that caused a lot of problems. And we've seen that uh, before in his history. And we need to be consistent. Let our yeas be yea and our nays be nay. And, and leave it at that. And uh, take a side, one way or the other, right? Uh, and so, again, Joseph, uh, again, maybe the naive, he just tells, I have another dream, you want to hear this one too? And he said, he's writing it down for posterity, writing it down and storing it away so that when it comes to pass, I'll show you I had this dream. We're just telling, uh, maybe just someone that would be encouraging of it, maybe just telling his mom. No, he tells them all. <laughs> he tells his brothers. He lets it, lets it be known, again, either at a, uh, naiveness or, or arrogance or just to fulfill God's purpose and plan and will. Verse 12, his brothers went to feed the, their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send them, send you to them. And so he said to him, here I am. Hineni, here I am. So he's obedient and willing to go. And so again, I think maybe he's just naive, right? He didn't say, well, you know, Dad, they don't like me very much, really, I gotta go, you know? <laughs> Can you find someone, let's send one of the servants and go find out, they're gonna not treat me so well, you know, I don't really, find some excuse, maybe not even be so honest, maybe just say, you know, Dad, I'm not feeling so good today, I sprained my ankle, it's a long trip, can you get someone? No, he just said, yeah, here I am, I'll go, oh, yeah, I haven't seen my brothers in, in a few weeks, I'll go see them, uh, I'll go, send me. And so uh, he's willing and obedient to his father and willing to help out his brothers. And uh, they've gone off there all together. Why he wasn't with them to begin with, I don't know. Maybe they're the ones who said, we don't want him with us. And so they, they knew he's a tattletale. And so somehow they, he wasn't with them that time. But his father still wants to know what's going on. He wants the tattletale. He wants to know. He wants the news. And so he sends them on. They went to Shechem. Now, if we remember Shechem, Shechem is the area in the city where the prince raped Leah's daughter, Dinah, and Simon and Levi killed all the men. And they took the women and all the plunder and the children for themselves. 
And so they go back to Shechem. Why? I don't know. I mean, obviously it was a green pasture land, obviously a good area because for the flocks, because that's why they settled there to begin with. But you would think going back there would be dangerous and not so good and whatever. Remember, whatever the whole deal with. They go there anyway. That's where they went. So they take the flock to Shechem. And so uh, Jacob sends Joseph to go and check on them. Verse 14, he said, please go and see if it is well with your brothers and well with the flock and bring word back to me. And so he sent him out of the valley of Hebron, and he went to Shechem. So again, he wants the news. He wants to hear the good, the bad. He knows that he's a good spy. He knows he's a good tattletale. So sends him off. Again, he's just setting him up for disaster continually. And uh, sends him from the valley of Hebron. And that's where Isaac was. So they're now settled where Isaac was, where Abraham was, where the, where the tomb of the patriarchs, Abraham and Sarah and and uh, Isaac and Rebekah is. And, and so he uh, sends them out from there to Shechem. And I'll show you here a little bit of map, kind of get an idea of the distance and where he went. Verse 15, a certain man found him wandering in the field. And the man asked him, what are you seeking? And he said, I'm seeking my brothers. Please tell them where, tell, tell me where they are feeding their flocks. And the man said, they have departed from here, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. So again, he's a very hard worker. He's very uh, conscientious. He's studious. He's uh, diligent. He's faithful, obedient. He could have just, you know, gone to Shechem. I don't see him here and go back. Dad, I went to Shechem like you asked me. I didn't see anything there. And I, so I came back. That's the news. That's the report. But no, he's searching in the field. He's looking for signs and tracking them. Maybe would track the animals. He's trying to find them. And then this certain man comes up. That's all the Bible says, a certain man. I wonder who that was. And maybe it was just a regular person, and that's fine. But maybe it was more than that. Or maybe it was a regular person who was sent by some force with this message. This certain man was there when the brothers were there. So he was hanging out. Not only was he there and saw them off in the area, but he also communicated with them, talked with them, heard them say they're going to Dothan. And then he's still there, who knows how many days or time period longer, when Joseph first arrives there, and he's still just hanging out there. What's he doing there? Was he a Shechemite? All well, the men of Shechem were dead. So who is this guy? What's he doing there? Why is he hanging out there? Has the city become rebuilt? Has the city become reoccupied? What is this certain man doing there? Well, could he have been sent from the devil, whether again in human form or, or an evil angel impersonating a certain man to set up the whole thing that takes place? But then God eventually undoes the evil that was meant. Or was it God set it up so that even though through the evil, God's purpose is done? Or was it just a certain man who just happened to be there and hanging out there all day long and all for weeks? I don't know. That's all the Bible says, a certain man. I just thought that was unique that he's there for that period of time and used in that way to send them on to Dothan. And so Joseph goes. And he goes to Joseph. And again, he could have gone back to his dad and said, okay, I met a guy there, and he said they went to Dothan. So I came back, I told you where they're at. They're in Dothan now. Now you know. <laughs> but no, he keeps on going. He wants to be with his brothers in spite of their hatred, in spite of them not talking nicely to him. Verse 18, And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. And they said to one another, Look, this dreamer is coming. Let's kill him and cast him into some pit. And we say, some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. So they can see him in a distance. They can tell by his gait. They can tell by his walk, his figure. Even though he's far away, they can tell this is Joseph. Here he comes, that dreamer. Can't even talk to him by, about name, that dreamer. Not even our brother, that dreamer. We'll get rid of his dreams. 
We'll get rid of him. We'll kill him. Now, someone had to come up with this idea first. They all in unison said, let's kill him. Somebody first suggested killing him. Who was it? Who did? Who done it? I believe it was Simeon. And I'll tell you why in a few more weeks. So come back for that. <laughs> anyway, they plot this together. They plan this. They come up with this devilish plan. We'll see what comes up with his dreams. Verse 21, but Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. Reuben said, shed no blood, but cast him into a pit, which is in the wilderness. Do not lay a hand on him, that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. So Reuben has some redeeming quality, right? Yeah, so he's got the lust issue, but here he's got a good conscience. He doesn't want to kill, doesn't want to kill his brother. He wants to send his brother back to his father. That's Reuben's desire. Verse 23, and when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors, and they cast him into a pit. And the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. So he's still wearing that coat. I don't know, if I was given a fancy coat, I don't know if I'd wear it on a several day journey through the dust and through the dirt and, and, and go into where the sheep are and the smell and the goats. And He's still wearing that thing. I mean, I think Jacob had enough money to buy him another coat, right? He probably had a second coat. I can't imagine this is his only coat. But this is the one he wears all the time. He wants his brothers to see it. He's proud of this coat. He loves this coat. It's his favorite coat. And his brothers hate this coat. Hey, and strip it off of him. Gassed him into the pit. And they sat down and ate a meal. Like nothing wrong. Nothing. Their conscience is just totally numb. They just go and eat a meal. They're plotting to kill him. They throw him in a pit. They leave him there and starve to death. And they go and eat a meal. Where did they get the meal from? I'd imagine Joseph brought him some treats from home. Dad sent him like, like David was sent with some treats for his brothers in the army and they treated David almost as bad. So he probably brought some, and they're out there in the field, their, their supplies are getting low and they've got only what they could take with them and, they, and Joseph brought some fresh stuff. And they were eating it. They might not have given Joseph any of it. He might have not eaten any. He might have been saving it to eat with his brothers. They threw him in a pit, maybe hungry and cold, no jacket. And they're up there eating. They go and eat and sit there and talk. Horrible. None of us know how low we can fall without the Lord. But there go us all, but by the grace of God. And what we can do and do to others. Sometimes with not a second thought about it. They lifted their eyes and looked, and there was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing spices and balm and mirth, and on their way to carry them down to Egypt. And Judah said to his brothers, what profit is there if we kill our brothers and conceal his blood? Let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. Let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brothers listened. I don't think he really has any concern for Joseph at this point. Selling him to the Ishmaelites is probably worse than death. Selling him as a slave in many ways would have been worse than death. Joseph ended up, thankfully, by God's grace, getting pretty good, but still, could have been a lot worse. And it was pretty horrible as it was. Joseph was maybe not worse than death, but a lot of people who were thrown into slavery, especially in that day and age, or really any day and age, some of them, what they experience is worse than death. So I don't think Judah's really concerned for Joseph here. Again, yeah, Judah might be even feeling even more so the angst of his father favoring Joseph over him, because again, he would be the next one that should have been in line for the birthright. And so he comes up with this plan, let's get rid of them all together. Right? So we, Reuben won't let us kill him, so the next best thing is to get him far, far away, sell him off. We leave him here in this pit, maybe he'll crawl out, maybe someone will find him. So let's Sell them. Get rid of them. 
And so they sell them off to the Ishmaelites. The Midianite traders pass by, and they use this word Midianite and Ishmaelite kind of interchangeably here. The Midianite traders passed by, and so the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. 20 shekels. That's only two per brother. Right? Joseph wouldn't get, Benjamin wouldn't get anything. And so two per brother, two shekels. That's it, two shekels. That's it. That's not much. Right? Especially in today's economy, that won't buy you hardly anything. Right? So <laughs> two shekels. They sold their souls for two shekels. Then Reuben returned to the pit, and indeed Joseph was not in the pit. And he tore his clothes, and he returned to the brothers and said, The lad is no more, and I, where shall I go? So it seems that after they threw him into the pit and they started to eat their meal, Reuben went off for a walk somewhere, whatever, found some excuse, going to go check on the herd or whatever. He went off on his own. The other nine are sitting there eating and plotting, and the Ishmaelites come, and again, Reuben's somewhere. He didn't even see any of this going on. Maybe he was planning his way to come back, maybe at nighttime and go to the pit, and none of the brothers will see him, and he'll be able to get Joseph out and send him back. So he went off on his own, so they wouldn't know. And uh, by the time he gets back, Joseph's gone. He doesn't know why. He comes in, he's gone. How can I go back to dad? Where can I go now? I'm the eldest. I got to tell dad that he's not here. I'm responsible. Once again, we see his conscience being quickened and Reuben being redeemed. They took Joseph's tunic, killed the kid of the goats, and dipped the tunic in the blood. And they brought the tunic of many colors to their father and said, we have found this. Do you know whether it is your son's tunic or not? So they take that tunic that they hate covered in blood from an animal, from a goat. They bring it to their dad. They don't even say Joseph's dead. They just kind of imply. They don't even mention Joseph by name. They can't even say his name. See if this is your son's tunic or not. They don't say our brother's. No, your son. They have totally distanced themselves. And that's what hatred will do. Right? There's some people that you don't even want to mention their name. Our hatred and jealousy and envy can get so bad. It's horrible. For a minute, he or she or this or that or whatever. Some derogatory term. I can't even mention his name. When we can't mention someone's name, that's a sure sign that we need to be confessed and surrendered in prayer. That our heart in that area of our life might be friendly to everybody else. And that area of our life, we need to surrender to the Lord. He recognized it and he said, it is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Without doubt, Joseph is torn to pieces. Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his waist, and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. He said, for I shall go down into the grave to my son in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Wow. Sorrow that he experienced. His hopes, his dreams, all placed upon this one son, his favorite son. He's devastated. And the peace that the brothers thought they might now have finally Delivered from Joseph, we don't have to hear about him anymore. We don't have to see him anymore. We don't have to hear about the tunic. We don't have to hear about him and praise by dad anymore. He's gone and be forgotten. It got worse. Every day he's crying and mourning and he's trying to comfort him. His sons are coming. The daughter-in-laws are coming. Everybody's trying to comfort him. He won't be comforted. And the spirit of depression falling on the camp and on the family. And the guilt now setting in upon the brothers. And the two lousy pieces of silver spent and gone. Nothing but guilt and shame upon them now. And they live with that for over 20 years, 22 years.
Verse 36, the Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and captain of the guard. And so we see here on the map where Hebron was, down here, and then uh, up to Shechem. You can see that's quite a distance, down from, equal down by the Dead Sea area, from Hebron all the way up to Shechem, up past north of Jerusalem. And uh, then he continues on to Dothan, so Dothan wasn't even backtracking, they had to go further to find them in Dothan. And then from Dothan to come down to Egypt, he would cut back, and on the way back, come not too far from maybe being able, in an eye view of even seeing the hills of Hebron, where his father was, and areas where they had camped, areas where they had taken the flock. And he can see that. And I imagine he's begging the Ishmaelites, please, let's do a little detour here. If you just go and stop in Hebron on the way, I know a guy there, he will pay you more than 20 shekels for me. But obviously it fell on deaf ears. And his hope sinks. Worse and worse and worse as they travel on past the hills of Hebron and closer and closer to Egypt. And that's where this chapter ends. So we've learned some lessons. We've learned the Bible story. We've learned some lessons for ourselves. But where's the gospel? Anyone see the gospel there? Where is the Lord in this? Well, let's take a look. Joseph, his brothers, his father, and his mother would bow down to him. The Bible tells us that to Yeshua, all the world will bow down to him. Joseph was sent by his father to seek his brothers. Yeshua was sent by the heavenly father to seek and to save that which was lost. The brothers were jealous of Joseph. The leaders were jealous of Yeshua. Maybe you see where we're going here with this. I came up with 14 different things. I thought, no one could top that. Well, Gloria topped that. She added a bunch on. <laughs> so we'll have some more in here. Brothers looked for ways to kill Joseph. And the leaders plotted ways to kill Yeshua. The brothers put Joseph in a pit. Yeshua was buried in a pit, in a cave, a hole in the ground. Joseph went to help his brothers and was rejected. Yeshua came to help us and was rejected. Judas sold Joseph for 20 pieces of silver. Judas sold Yeshua for 30 pieces of silver. You know why one was 20 and one was 30? Inflation. <laughs> no, but I, it's just an interesting thing. I got this from Gloria. The 20 to 30 ratio, if you divide 20 by 30, 20 over 30, is 0.666. 666666 six, 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 all the way. Yeah. And interesting, right? You got it. Wow. <laughs> oh, wow. Hey, Joseph was taken down to Egypt. Yeshua went down to Egypt. Parallels of their lives. It's amazing. Brothers said he was dead when he wasn't. Leaders said Yeshua was dead when he wasn't. And both knew it. The brothers knew he wasn't dead and yet said he was dead or intimated he was dead. The leaders knew the tomb was empty. They knew the soldiers came and said, the tomb rolls away. He's not there. It's empty. And they told the story anyway. Silenced them, paid them, forced them, threatened them, and they went with the story that he's dead. Joseph was believed to be dead, but alive. Yeshua died, but is alive. Right? So they told the story and Jacob believed it. And the others believed it. 
Yeshua died, and there's this lie that he's dead, that there is no salvation, there is no God, there is no, and they don't believe it. But the fact of the matter is, he's rose from the dead, and he's interceding on our behalf right now. Joseph went to the Gentiles. The gospel has gone to the Gentiles. Joseph helped all who came to him when he becomes Pharaoh's right-hand man. And salvation has been offered to all the world. Whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And when Joseph was in the position and there was famine in the land, anyone who came and paid was provided. Joseph became a slave. Yeshua became a slave for us. He lowered himself from not robbery to be equal with God, lowered himself lower than the angels, lowered himself down to humanity, not just any humanity, born in a smelly, stable, died a criminal death, cursed of God, washed his disciples' feet, ministers for, to us. Servant. As Isaiah 53 refers to him as this suffering servant. Joseph came back to rescue Israel. And Yeshua is coming back to save all of Israel. Amen. He's coming on the yeah. cloud. He's coming with chariots. He's coming to redeem. Raise the dead. Raise those who have died in Messiah. Raise up those who have trust in him and are alive and remain and will meet together in the air and be brought to the promised land. To a land flowing with plenty. Joseph was stripped of his tunic. Yeshua was stripped naked and hung on a tree. Brothers were plotting as he came near. Herod tried to kill Yeshua when he was born. So when he was coming near, when he was coming in the beginning, even up to before he was anything, under two years old, Herod was plotting his death. Even before he showed up, Joseph showed up in the camp, his brothers were plotting his death. His brothers were eating and plotting what to do with him. And the leaders were eating Passover when they were plotting his death. Reuben was terrified at the empty pit. The leaders were terrified by the empty tomb. After death, he was raised to the right hand of the throne in Pharaoh, in Egypt, to Pharaoh's court. And Yeshua, after death, has been raised up to the right hand of the Father and on the throne. Joseph's tunic was dipped in blood. Yeshua's tunic says he will, in Revelation, that he's coming on the white horse, coming back, and his robe is dipped in blood. So his royal robe is dipped in blood. Joseph's royal robe was dipped in blood. Yeshua's royal robe as he's come back as a conquering judge. The judge this earth is dipped in his own blood for our salvation. There's others I forgot to put on there. Uh, The Ishmaelites came on camels with spices and myrrh. And the wise men came also from the east with on camels with spices and myrrh. And maybe you can think of others as without plenty, but it's powerful. It's powerful. So Joseph in his life, in his suffering, and in his exaltation, represents the Messiah in his suffering and in his exaltation. And the same for us. It is through suffering that we go up. So the further we go down, the further we surrender all, 
The more we manifest God's grace, the more we reflect his character, the more the people of this world will hate us. The more we will be persecuted for righteousness' sake. But the higher God will be able to lift us up and exalt us and seat us also at his right hand, at his throne, with him for all eternity. Isn't that beautiful? The powerful, all these different examples. And again, no doubt more. The gospel is everywhere. Yeshua is everywhere. We need to allow God to open our eyes so that we can see him in all of his word and in the lives of others. And so, as we pray, there's some area that applies to your life. We don't want to just know these things. We want to be transformed, and the way to transformation is through confession, through cleansing, through surrender, through filling with God's Spirit. And so if there's some area in your life that maybe you've been favoring others, exalting some over others, unjustly, unfairly, loving others more than others, loving someone or some group other than, more than others. God's bringing anything to your mind, a person or people group, or surrender it to the Lord. Confess it to him. Again, there's areas, I mean, some had five talents, three talents, one talent. There's areas, differences of pay or differences of usefulness. And, but love should be equal. If there's any envy, any jealousy in your life, maybe you've been mistreated, maybe you've been overlooked unjustly or justly, but it still hurts, surrender it to the Lord. Trust in him. Joseph's story is not over yet. In our, where we're at in the study, the end of chapter 37, it doesn't end there. And your story is not over yet either. Right? If you've been sold out to slavery, if you've been mistreated and abused, if you've been hated and unloved, and it seems like you're in a dismal place, you're trapped, you feel trapped, discouraged, depressed, seemingly no hope, you've been forsaken, don't give up. The story is not over yet. Joseph will be exalted. And God will exalt you. In his timing, in his way. Maybe not on this earth, maybe on this earth, but maybe not. But one day, hang on to the Lord, trust in him, and he will raise you up. And so if there's somewhere in your life right now, you're feeling rejected, you're feeling put down, you're feeling depressed, feeling discouraged. Maybe from... Areas in your past, maybe a parent didn't treat you right, maybe a boss, maybe community. Maybe you're feeling alone. You're not alone. God's eyes are upon you. Yes. Trust in him. If you've been abusive to somebody, you've plotted their death, they're firing, they're unjustly, they're... Maybe you didn't physically kill them, but you wanted them dead. <laughs> Praying evil against them, thinking evil against them. Surrender that to the Lord. If you've physically hurt someone, physically done damage, surrender that to the Lord and be cleansed. If you've lied, covered up your sins, to humanity, God sees all. Surrender that to the Lord. Receive his forgiveness. If you've been boastful and proud, exalting yourself, flaunting your talents and gifts before others, surrender that to the Lord. Confess it to him. If you're encouraged by the comparisons of 
Joseph and Yeshua. And you trust by faith that God wants to do those comparisons with your life as well. That he wants you to represent him and he already is. But you want to praise him and thank him and acknowledge that. Whether in the sufferings and the losses and the disappointments, but also in the exaltation. That your life, all of our lives, can mirror and represent Yeshua. What a high calling, what a high privilege. And you want to accept your fate and thank the Lord for it. And through your sufferings, your blessings, that God is honored and glorified. If any of those areas apply to you, or maybe some other area from this story, that God's speaking to your heart and mind about, let us pray and thank the Lord. We praise your name, Lord, for your word. Thankful for it lays it out for us as an example. Thank you, Lord, for Joseph. Thank you for sustaining him through his suffering. Thank you for never leaving him. Thank you for having your eyes upon him. Thank you for understanding our suffering because you have also come here and suffered in like manner. And you know our pain and you know our difficulties and you know our troubles. And so we want to surrender all to you. We don't want to have any anger, any enemy, any animosity, any pride, any self-exaltation, any favoritism, any corruption, any greed, any hatred, any anger, any revenge, any insecurities. Cleanse us through the blood of Messiah. Reveal to us if there's anyone in our life you want us to surrender to you. Anyone that we've hurt or anyone we've exalted, anyone who's hurt us, anyone who's put us down, is anyone that our heart is not right with you regarding? Is anyone that we can't talk peaceably to? Is anyone that we can't think peaceably about? Bring them to our minds. We surrender them to you. We surrender our attitudes and our evil hearts to you. Thank you for cleansing us through the blood of Yeshua. Fill us with your spirit. Fill us with love and compassion. Fill us with your mercy and your grace. Live inside us. And manifest yourself through us. And relive your life through us. Through sufferings and blessings. In all our ways, may we exalt you. In Yeshua's holy name. Amen.